Georgina Lewis here at Augusta Richmond County Public Library, your favorite librarian in training. And we're here today with our monthly book talk. I'm so excited for this one. So we are getting into our spooky season, our chills and thrills. And because of this, I've invited Mr. Michael Forsythe. He is an accomplished author, and today he's going to spill the tea on his book, Hour of the Beast. Thank you for being with me today, virtually. Thank you for having me. All right. So, Hour of the Beast. Um, it's this particular spooky season, and hopefully when people see this, it'll be around Halloween and such. So, can you tell us about your chiller thriller? Well, Hour of the Beast is a go for the juggler horror story. A woman experiences on her wedding night a fate worse than death at the hands of a werewolf. And nine months later, she gives birth to a pair of identical twins. I'm sorry, fraternal twins, one of whom is a werewolf. And 18 years later, when they get to college, all hell breaks. People okay. start to die. <laughs> and a Black woman professor who is a professor of anthropology becomes a supernatural sleuth, as it were, solves the mystery of who is the werewolf and what is going on. Mm, okay, awesome. So where did you even get the inspiration for this? Um, the werewolves and um, I noticed that the setting that we talked about was college setting. So where did you get the inspiration for Hour of the Beast? Well, the immediate inspiration was that I was driving along a dark road at night and it just suddenly occurred to me, wow, what if something jumped in front of the car and there are two people in the car and one person says, oh, was a dog, and the other person thinks, no, 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 it was a person. And well, what would happen next? And what would happen next? Um, the setting um, comes from my own college experiences. I went to Yale, which has a very gothic appearance, the buildings, and it has features such as tunnels that go under the buildings from one connecting one building to the other. And, it was a natural setting for a story like this. And, and then ultimately, werewolves come from my own nightmares. As a child, I had nightmares almost on a nightly basis about werewolves. They've been with me for a long time. And so that definitely fed into the creation of this book. Oh, wow. Um, as someone who drives down dark Georgia roads, that would be very creepy <laughs> for me to experience myself. Um, so you started to talk about the characters, and I know that there are the fraternal twins, one being the werewolf and one um, being the more, I guess you could say the more human one. Um, so do you see yourself in either one of those characters or any of those characters from the book? Well, I think of the two of them, and among all the other characters in the book, I think I would identify with the brother, um, Jason, who is a more timid fellow, or intellectual, and a non-athlete, um, compared to his brother, who's very athletic and, and macho. And um, I did incorporate into the story some experiences from my own past as a freshman in college, I remember one um, afternoon, my roommates and I came back to our room and we saw that the college football players from across the hall had posted on the door a list of rules about how mm -hmm. people were to conduct themselves. And you know, you feel, in a way it's sort of funny, but you also feel a bit impotent uh, in the case of the alpha males. So, took some of those experiences, that feeling about always being under heel and, and incorporated that into the character. 
Mm -hmm. So a lot of people say that when they read your book, uh, Hour of the Beast, that it reminds them of an 80s horror film. So I want to ask you, how did you feel about that? Do you see that as like an honor or insult? And do you feel like your book reads like an 80s horror film? Well, that's so funny. I mean, I think it hopefully it reads like something that was written by Stephen King. That was what my wow. idol back in the 80s. Um, I guess I'd wear, wear that as a badge of honor and that so many great movies came out of the 80s. Uh, the Howling, which is about a, a werewolf, or Nightmare on Elm Street, Fright Night. I guess I, I like that uh, sensibility. In a way, it... Uh, could be something that uh, one is upset about to hear that the book reads like something from the 80s and you feel like, is it, uh, are you writing stuff that's dated? But then you think about all the movies that are coming out of Hollywood now and so many of them are reboots and remakes yes. and revisionings. <laughs> it's a bit silly to even worry about something being dated. Yeah, I was about to say, I think they're like doing a continuation of like the craft and other things. So like they people reach back all the time and use inspiration from there. So speaking of like inspiration and different things like that, what inspires you to write? Hmm, that's a very good question. I just feel that there are stories bubbling up in my imagination all the time. That's just how I am. I don't have to really necessarily think of ideas. They're always coming to me and bubbling up. I guess that's just the way I respond to the environment around me and process things that are happening around me. And so it's more a matter of shutting them off, <laughs> shutting some of them off and picking one idea that really speaks to me and, mm -hmm. um, that I can really feel an urge to tell other people about. Um, and that's what really gets me going. Okay, awesome. So we know you've written uh, horror and stuff and things like that. Do you write in any other genres? Yeah, I have really touched base with uh, a lot of different genres. So Out of the Beast was my first novel. And then the second book I wrote was a story of love and adventure that takes place in ancient Africa. It's called The Blood of Titans. In some ways, it's a traditional historical romance, romance novel, but set in a place that you wouldn't ordinarily see it, a story like that. So it's a story of a princess of an advanced civilization who falls in love with warrior king, this magnificent mountain of a man. Um, the only problem is that one, their kingdoms are at war, and second, that it's a time of polygamy, so he already has a first wife. So there's a passionate love triangle that takes place between the three of them, set against the backdrop of this clash of civilizations. Um, the second book I wrote was a story involving Harry Houdini, a famous magician and escape mm -hmm. artist. And in this, he solves a paranormal mystery with the help of Arthur Conan Doyle, the writer of the Sherlock Holmes stories. They were friends in real life and later in later years became bitter enemies. Mm -hmm. But in this story, but they are working together as a, a team. So it's kind of a mismatched buddy story. And I later did another Houdini story. In this case, he is opposed to Rasputin's. Houdini versus Rasputin. Rasputin mm -hmm. being the mystic who served with the um, Tsar's family at the end of the Russian Empire and was just this very sinister character who claimed to have magical powers. So it's a clash between two people coming at magic from two different 
angles. And, and the last one I did was um, The Identity Thief, which was a straight up thriller, sort of along the lines of the born identity or um, North by Northwest, the sort of thing where the character is on the run. Mm -hmm. And it's about an impersonator who impersonates the worst possible person and ends up a fugitive himself on the run. Oh, wow. So you have really hopped around with the genres. We've got romance, we've got thrillers. Um, so for you, do you feel like there was anything that like helped prepare you to be a, a writer or an author? Like you have all these stories in your head. Like how do you manage that? Well, I gotta tell you the best experience I had in preparing me to be a writer was that I worked for years, I would say about nine years, for a publication called the Weekly World News, which was a sister publication of the old, of the National Enquirer. And basically, it was all creative writing. We just flat out made up stories about space aliens and the Noah's Ark being found and that type of thing. And it prepared me for writing in a number of ways. One was because it was a nine to five job. We showed up and worked in an office. It made me always think of writing as a profession, not a hobby. And you couldn't have um, writer's block. If you said you had a writer's block, uh, the editors would say, oh, well, I guess we have a block against paying you this week. And um, it also taught me to learn how to take a, perhaps a flimsy premise and make it believable, think it through, think of the steps that would have to be true for the story to be true. So for example, a really, usually we got to make up our own stories, which I loved, mm -hmm. come up with our own ideas, but sometimes you had to execute an idea that was handed to you by the editor. So a preposterous sounding idea I was given once was gay skeletons found in Titanic ice rain. In other words, now because some iceberg is melted or something like that, it's been found in an old life rain, the remains, the skeletons of two sailors who were gay in an embrace, locked in this eternal embrace. Okay, that is so silly on so many levels, but I had to think it through and, and do research about the Titanic and what life was like for people on it, and then slowly build a story by which, by through the different diaries and things that were found, create a story that is believable and in some ways compelling. So it becomes this uh, touching love story of these sailors who had this love affair, this love that dared not speak its name back in that time. And, and people loved it. Oh, wow. That's so doing that, learning to do research um, and, and make the unbelievable believable really prepared me. Mm -hmm. Well, you have given us so much of your time and talked about your wonderful novels. So before we let you go, what advice would you give to um, a writer or an aspiring writer, shall we say, who is looking to publish and maybe they have that story in their head and they aren't sure about writing it down? What advice would you give to someone who's aspiring to be a writer? Well, the three pieces of advice I would give are this. Number one, read a lot. I'm going to borrow from Stephen King. His point that he made was that if you don't have enough time to read, you don't have enough time to write, nor do you have the tools that you need to write. If you read, you will get even without studying literature necessarily, but just by reading, you will absorb osmosis, so many tricks to the trade, so many techniques, as well as expanding your vocabulary. And I'd say the next piece of advice I would give would be to 
to join a writer's group. And there are always writers, libraries and different organizations, and you just Google it. And this will give you exposure to create um, constructive criticism. You just have to have enough um, a thick skin to take constructive criticism um, from people who are more objective than, say, your mother says, oh, it's, this stuff is great. And you'll find that there are times where you have a writing problem. You just can't figure it out. And then somebody looks at it just off the bat, comes up with a, a great solution for it. Um, so I would say a writer's group. And also, it gives you impetus to write because you don't have just a very vague sense that in three years, when something's published, someone may be reading this thing. You know that two weeks from now, the next meeting, someone will be reading your work. And now you've made a commitment to do it. Um, and then I would just say the last thing is just to be aware that it's going to take time to come up with something good and to be willing put in that work because it's kind of easy to come up with a good idea for a book. And even from one's own life, most people at some point in their life, by the time they're an adult, something has happened in their life that's worth talking about that would probably make a good story. But there's a journey from having a good idea, having a finished work. And you just have to be willing to take that time to take that journey, to do those steps. And then, you know, when you have that first draft done and you're like, Eureka, the fact is that it's going to take um, multiple revisions and editing and let people, and this is where the writer's group comes in again. You have um, a beta group, beta readers, you know, people who, opinion you've learned to trust, read it over, and they may say something like, this is great, except, and that except might be something that's going to take time to do, but in the end, it, it's worth it. Oh, wow. Well, you have been a joy to talk to and a wealth of information. If you want books like Hour of the Beast or even something that's like Identity Thief, you know, you can get that here at your Augusta Richmond County Public Library. Now, you can either curbside or come inside. If you do curbside, which we are still doing, you can place your book on hold in the Pines catalog and we will bring your books right out to your car. Or you can place it on hold and come inside and see us and pick up your materials that are on hold. Also, if you guys don't already know, we have switched over to Libby for your um, reading download materials so make sure that you look out for that and ask the library about that so you can continue to get all of your chills and thrills during this holiday season well thank you so much again mr forsyth for talking with us and thank you all for joining us until next time bye, bye.